History of Italian Renaissance Art by Frederick Hart, David G. Wilkins, 7th edition, chapter 1. Sorry, I thought I had it set there. I will show the map so you can kind of get a basis if you need to pause it. Chapter 1, Prelude, Italy, Italian Art. The matrix of Italian art is Art Italy itself, figure 0.1.1. The variety of landscape transforms a country roughly the size of California into a subcontinent harboring an infinity, infinity of pictorial surprises. Alpine masses shining with snow in midsummer fantastic do dolomitic cracks. Turquoise lakes reflecting sunlight onto the cliffs. Fertile plains, popular bordered rivers, sandy beaches, Apennine mountain ch chains, enclosing green valleys, vast pasture lands, glittering bays, enclosed by mountains, volcanic islands, dark forests, eroded de deserts, gentle hills, all combine to make up the land of Italy. The variety of natural elements and the way in which the mountains separate one area from another also helped to explain the diversity of Italian art created in various centers during the Renaissance. But not all the bounty, uh, I'm sorry, all the beauty of Italy was provided by nature. The country and its people have made their place, made their peace in an extraordinary way. Many towns and even some large cities do not lie in the valleys but that are perched on hilltops, sometimes at dizzying heights. The reason for such positions is not hard to understand. The most, for, the, for most Italian towns were founded when defense was essential. At the same time, the views from their ramparts offered an inhabitants not only a military, but also an intellectual command of surrounding nature. Where the land is fertile, those hills that are not crowned with villages, castles, or vias have been turned into stepped gardens that with terraces where wheat, the olive, and the vine are those essentials of Italian civilizations grow together. Only here and there does one come across wild tracts that have defied attempts at cultivation agricultural and forests so how are submitted to the ordinary ordering intelligence of human activity on the lombard plains plots of woodland are marshaled in the battalions like perfect sentinels cypresses guard the tuscan hills 300 year old olive trees shimmer in gray and silver winter and summer alike the Italian climate is less gentle than its reputation. Even in southern Italy and Sicily, winter can be dark and wet, while throughout the peninsula, summer can be hot, autumn rains, rainy, and spring capricious. Yet in three millennia of stor stormy marriage with the land, the Italians have created a harmony between human life and the natural world that is seldom elsewhere. During the modern era, the forces of industrialization have drained some historic hill farms of their population. Stone farmhouses now stand abandoned among unintended olive trees and crumbling terraces. But one can still experience the Italian concord with nature. Country roads can be traveled on hill farms, are worked by pairs of long-horned oxen. Views across lines of cypress and up rocky ledges reveal what might be to the background of a fresco by Benizoe, Benizo Ghazali. The vast um, Umbrian spaces are much as Perugino saw them, and the woods in the Venetian plain seem ready to disclose a nymph of sat and satire from the paintings of Giovanni Bellini representing this world. Some of the earliest attempts at naturalistic representation found in Italian painting document of local landscape, Lombard 
Ambrosio Lorenzetti's view of the countryside around Siena and his allegory of good government in the city of country. See figure 4.28. For example, in the Tuscan fields, that Gentile de Fabriano placed behind a fleeing holy family in the flight into Egypt. See figure 8.4. It might be said that the historic and 14th and 15th century paintings in Italy can be understood as an attempt by artists to capture naturalism. During these centuries, painters experimented trying to learn how to represent on a two-dimensional -dimension, surface what is seen by the human eye, the effect of receding space we can we experience we move in the world the bulk and weight of figures and objects and their tie to gravity on the softening effects of atmosphere in a landscape view sculptors from the same period gradually realized how to represent figures in positions that suggest the potential for movement wearing clothes that seem to respond to new naturalistic poses. An example of this would be Donatello's St. Mark's, see figure 7.2, one two, I'm sorry. When the world, word naturalism is used in this book, it is describing the broad effects outlined above. In assessing art, a difference is usually established between naturalism and realism. While naturalism refers to the attempt to mimic what we are or what we see, realism refers to the representation of the real world without idealization. Realism is less common in Italian Renaissance art because of, its, of the strong interest shown by patrons and artists in the no notion of ideal beauty. See, for example, Michelangelo's David's or Raphael's Donna Valletta. See figure 16.1, 17.4. Among the relatively rare examples of realism during the Renaissance, we might cite Masaccio's painting of a shivering man waiting to be baptized in a cold river, or Afid Galizia's portrait of Paola. Mauricio, see figures 8.1, 20.57. After the introduction of oil paint into Italy, some artists tried to represent the effects of light at, as its history to every fold of silk in lustrous fabric, as in Moretto's portrait of a young man, or every wrinkle in an old man's face. As again in Galazio's portrait of Paola Mauricio, such effects are described as naturalistic or realistic detail, respectively, representing the world around them as one of the important ways in which Renaissance artists articulated the new ideas circulating in cities in the Italian peninsula during this period. The interest in the real world expressed by naturalism and realism is yet another reason why the Renaissance has recently been described as the beginning of the early modern period. The role of antiquity. The harmony with nature discussed above helps explain why Italian Renaissance art is distinctive. Another factor is the survival of artists and architectural monuments from the culture of ancient Rome. Sarcophagi, sculptures, and coins were abundant, as were fragments of architecture, architectural structures, some of which had been reused as decoration and or structure in medieval buildings. Entire ancient monuments seldom survived. One exception is the Pantheon in Rome, the impressive dome of which soars 144 feet above the floor, the domes of both Florence Cathedral and St. Peter's in Rome, were responses to the challenge pre-offered proffered by the dome of the Pantheon. 
Also in Rome was the grand ruin of the Colosseum, the fabric of which had been mined for centuries because it provided an abundant source of cut stone. Only when Pope Benedict the Fourteenth halted, halted the destruction in 1749 was the Colosseum saved. The half columns of the Colosseum's exterior provided Renaissance architects with the demonstration of how Greek how the Greek architectural orders could be applied to a structure influencing such monuments as the Le Leon Battista, Alberta's Palazzo Rucciali. Even an ancient coin or fragmentary torso of a sculpted figure could be could provide inspiration to Renaissance artists. Ancient works were presumed to be illustrations of ancient life. Renaissance artists and architects made drawings from ancient Rome, Roman remains, and human, humanists and artists were excited when new examples were found. In 1506, the heroic group of Lachun and his sons, see figure 17.3, was discovered and in the ruins of the Golden House of Nero in Rome. The dramatic, physical, and emotional struggle seen in these figures had an almost immediate impact on the works of Michelangelo. See, for example, figures 17.42 and 17.43. Another important discovery was a fragment that became known as the Belvedere, the Belvedere torso. See figure 17.4. Because it was installed in the Belvedere, the new Belvedere Palace, now part of the Vatican Museums, the bronze equestrian monument of the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius had been visible in Rome throughout the Middle Ages when it was revered because it was presumed to be a portrait of the Emperor Constantine who had allowed Christianity to be practiced freely within the Roman Empire during the Renaissance. His statue was appreciated as an impressive work of art, and it played a role in inspiring Donatello's and Ver Verrocchio's monuments to contemporary mercenary generals. One of the best preserved examples of the ideal new male figure available during the Renaissance was the Apollo Belvedere. When and where the sculpture, let's go on to the next page. I'm gonna go ahead and do a little close up with the pictures and the captions so that you can read those at your leisure. Try to tilt that so it doesn't have a shadow, sorry. Was discovered is unknown, but it was in the Palpal collections in by 1509 and the Belved in the Belvedere by 1511. Some of Michelangelo's works can be compared to the Apollo Belvedere, including Bacchus and Christ in the early Piazza. But in general, Michelangelo has added a level of emotional ex expression not found in the Apollo. Several other types of ancient sculpture also provided inspiration, including sarcophagi, standing male figures wearing togas or armor or relief sculptures, the large relief of Marcus Aurelius sacrificing before the Capitoline temple, probably originally decorated a triumphal arc. At least 13 Renaissance drawings of this relief are known. The high relief figure of Marcus Aurelius to the left of center stands in the relaxed position known as contrapposto, a pose common in Greek and Roman sculpture and often adopted during the Renaissance. 
while the manner in which his toga both conceals and reveals his body can be compared to similar effects in Renaissance figures by Donatello and Nani in Di Banco. The realistic treatment of the heads in the relief note, especially that of the figure to the far right, demonstrates another important classical classical at attribute that inspired Renaissance sculptures. The impact of these and other work, ancient works on Renaissance artists and architects will become evident in the following chapters. Artifacts, art, and architecture from the Greco-Roman world were supplemented by ancient texts, which were studied by humanists, the scholar teachers, this period, teachers of pe this period, the human dignity of crit critical reasoning they found in ancient writings played an important role in the transformation of art, played an important role in the trans, oh, I'm sorry, art and society that we now call the Italian Renaissance. While the humanists showed an interest in all areas of ancient learning, they were at the same time determined to reconcile the ideas they found in Greek and Roman authors with Christian reliefs, Christian beliefs. The ancient material had been available throughout the Middle Ages, but during that period it had little effect. Changes in late medieval society, the culture must have prepared the way that the the way so that Renaissance soldier, scholars and artists could be respective to the visual and intellectual impact of the remains of the greco roman world. The story of the Italian Renaissance as a historical and cultural whole is complex and the role of antiquity in the creation of works of art is only part, one part of a much larger narrative that is still being analyzed. The cities, the art, culture, and history discussed in this volume were focused on cities on the Italian peninsula. The growth of these cities, the wealth accumulated there, and the increasing sophistication of urban life are important foundations for the development that became the Renaissance. To speak of these cities as Italian as is factually incorrect, for the nation of Italy, it was not established until the second half of the 19th century. The term Italian cities is correct only in the sense that the centers existed on the Italian peninsula uh, and their citizens were unified by a common language, albeit one, of, one divided into many distinct dialects. The, the Italian language uses the same word, pace, for the village and country. In the sense of a nation and to medieval Italian, the boundaries of country did not extend beyond what could be seen from the hilltop village. Maps of Italy in the late Middle Ages and early Renaissance looks like mosaics, the pieces representing political, representing political, entities that were sometimes hardly larger than a village. These communes, which have been, have often been compared to the city-states of ancient Greece, were all that remained of the Roman Empire or of the kingdoms and dukedoms founded in the disruptive period following the barbarian invasions and the ensuing breakup of ancient Roman society. At the outset of the late Middle Ages, most city-states were republics, but Lombardy in the northwest, some were ruled by the, their bishops. In general, the republics were merchant cities, and their governor, governments were dominated by manufacturers, traders, and bakers. bankers. These republics were often in a state of war with each other, even with neighbors Florence and Fiosol. Fiosolo, Assasi, with per Perugio, Perugia, even more descriptive, 
I'm sorry, disruptive than the intercommunal wars. However, were the eruptions of family against family and party against party within the communes under such conditions, it was easy for powerful individuals to undermine the independence of a city-state. Nobles in their castles, mercenary generals, Austin sensibly hired to protect the Republic, and powerful merchants struggled to gain control of the prosperous towns. Their success in the 14th and 15th centuries often led to the loss of communal liberties. The most successful of these super polities was the papacy, which maintained various degrees of control over a wide belt of central Italian cities from its center in Rome. Some of the republics were destined for greatness by this 13th century. Venice had established an enormous empire in support of its commercial ties with the East. By the end of the 13th century, Florence was trading with northern Europe and Asia, and had so many branches of its banking firms in Europe that Pope Innocent III declared that there must be five elements rather than four, because wherever earth, water, fire, and air were from, found in combination, one also saw Florentines. Other important republics included Siena, Lucia, Pisa, and Genoa all of which were separate, proud, independent states. Each state, whether a republic or ruled by a, a despo, tended to absorb its smaller neighbors by conquest or purchase. As a result, by the end of the 15th century, the peninsula was divided into a decreasing number of pol polities each dominating a relatively large subject territory. Yet they were unable to unite against the menace of the increasing centralized monarchies of the rest of Europe, which in the 16th century were threatened Italy, were to threaten Italy on several occasions. Florence's ground reveals the nature of the expansion of one Italian city-state. See map 2, page 13. A bird's eye view of this view shows the city in the 15th century when it was the largest in Europe. With more than 100,000 inhabitants, the cathedral's Renaissance dome formed a focus for the city, which was surrounded by walls and Tuscan hills. The core of the late medieval city was the ancient city plan with north and south, north to south, and east to west streets intersecting at right angles, an order urban design still visible on the map today. By the 13th century, the city had outgrown this core and more inhabitants clustered around the gates than within the ancient city plan. These areas of the city developed with no urban planning during the Middle Ages and they were less regular than the ancient Roman center. During the 13th century, a fortified city wall was built to protect the city. Later, a 14th century circle of walls encompassed an area so large that the city had not filled it by the 19th century. Its gates were decorated with paintings and sculpture, both civic and religious in nature. Here is the map. I'll try and get as close as I can. The print shows in figure 1.8 documents in in 18th century Florentine festival, but it reminds us how the civic and religious spaces of the Italian Middle Ages and Renaissance provided a setting for public festivities and ceremonies. Fairs, theatrical productions, sporting events, weddings, funerals, triumphal processions, while records, documents, 
the co costumes, floats, music, temporary triumphal arches, dramatic productions, and the other aspects of such events. The visual evidence is slim. Only a latter representation, such as these, can suggest the excitement of such an experience within its communal setting. Even today, on certain national, regional, and civic holidays, elaborate traditional processions and rituals play an important role of the life of Italian cities. The hill town of Siena is located some 45 miles south of Florence over winding roads in the Middle Ages, probably a day's journey on the horseback. A wealthy commercial and political rival of Florence Siena was conquered by Florence in the Middle Ages of the 16th century. Instead of the four square intersections and powerful cubic masses of Florence, Siena presents us with the climbs of and descendants, winding streets and unexpected vistas. The Sienese were proud of their city and its reputation as a religious, charitable, and intellectual center. During the late 13th and 14th centuries, the city seems to have been governed fairly and justly by civic-minded citizens. The city of Venice, figure 1.10, see map 3, page 14, is a unique in its position with buildings supported by wooden piles in a lagoon along with the Adriatic shore Venice had no need for city walls or the massive houses construction of mainland towns. The result was an architecture whose freedom and openness comes as a surprise when compared to the fortress-like character of many Italian cities. The great S-shaped form that divides Venice is that is the Grand Canal, along which the city's wealthiest citizens built their palaces. In the 13th century, Rome was still relatively unimportant, and during this the period from 1309 to 1377, when the Pope's residents were... Oh, like when they finish the sentence like that. There you go. So you can look at the picture closely. I didn't get the glare off there so you can see that real well. There we go. When the Pope's residence were in Florence, there was a little artistic activity. Only in the later 15th century did the papacy show a renewed vigor by beginning to commission works of art there. By the beginning of the 16th century, when the papacy was an important political and territorial force, Rome had become the crucible for all, for the full expression of what is known as the High Renaissance. The, guy, the guilds and the status of the artists the typical central and northern Italian city-state of the late Middle Ages was dominated by guilds, independent associations of businessmen, bankers, and artisan manufacturers. In virtually every sphere of commercial and political life, the Florentine Republic was founded on commerce and ruled by the representatives of these guilds. The guilds, however, were forced to accept the domination of the parte guefa, the single political entry permitted in this proto-democracy. It considered restrictive by modern standards as it standards it was in advance of anything conceived of in of in Western Europe since the days of the Pericles and ancient Athens in, Ro in Florence, the position of the guilds was expressed by the figures of their patron saints in niches at Orson Michel, a civic building that held the food supply guaranteed by the Republic during an era when famine was a constant threat. 
The seven major guilds, Ardi as they call, were called, comprised the Ardi de Camilla, refiners of imported wool woolen cloth, the Arte della Lana wool merchants who manufactured cloth, the Arte de, de, de Guiche e Notai for judges and notaries, the Arte del Cambino, Cambio for bankers and money changers, the Arte della Seta for silk weavers, the Arte de Medici e Speziella for doctors and pharmacies, and the Arte de Viale, 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 a Policia for furs, furriers. Painters were admitted to the Guild of Doctors and Pharmacies in 1314, perhaps because they had to grind their colors just as pharmacists ground materials for medicines. In the 1340s, painters were classified as dependents of physicians, perhaps because painters and doctors enjoyed the protection of St. Luke, who was reputedly both artist and physician. Only in 1378 did the painters become an independent branch within the Medici C. Spizzelli. The number of intermediate and minor guilds was constantly shifting. Among the format never admitted to the rank of the major guilds was the Art de Pieta e Leg Legnami, artisans who worked in stone and wood. This guild included only those sculptors who specialized in these two materials. A sculptor trained in metals such as bronze was required to join a guild, a major guild, the Arte de della Seta, goldsmiths and armors, each had their own guild. At the bottom of the social structure, outside the guilds, were there wool carters on those labors of much of the fortune of the city depended. The, their situation in some ways was comparable to that of the slaves of ancient Athens. For although the Chiampa, as they were called, were permitted to leave their employment, their activities were stick, strictly conscribed circumscribed by law. These workers who constantly hovered on the brink of starvation revolted in 1378 and founded a guild of their own. But this organization and its participation in government were both short-lived. The oligar uh, oligarchy resumed control and put down in the Chiampa by mass slaughter and individual execution, thus resuming control over the economic and political fortunes of the Republic. The guilds to which artists belonged were part of the mechanical arts, nor the richer defined liberal arts, grammar, logic, rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music, which were considered only <clears throat> the only activities suitable for a gentleman in medieval feudal societies. And the, let me go ahead and let you read this. In the Italian arts, in the Italian city-states, however, being linked to the mechanical mechanical arts represented a positive advantage to painters, sculptors, and architects because of the greater independence this made possible. To demonstrate how contemporary work is related to the Genesis narrative, Florentine professionals professions were represented in a series of reliefs on the exterior of the Campo, Campanile, the bell tower of the Cathedral of Florence. Subsequent relief represents the early activities of humanity with the mechanical arts among them, including painting, sculpting, and architecture. Later painting and sculpture were included among the liberal arts in the late 14th century. The Florentine writer, writer 
Filippo Villani compared the painters of his era to those who practice the liberal arts. In 1404, the, the Paduan humanist Pier Paul Piallo Fergio claimed erroneously that painting had been one of the four liberal arts taught to ancient Greek boys. At the end of the 15th century, ancient Leonardo da Vinci wrote eloquently about the importance of liberal of the liberal arts for artists. The stakes were economic as well as social evidence suggests that the 15th century artist was generally not well paid, although the, in the 16th century Michelangelo, who claimed noble ancestry, Titan, Titian, who was ennobled by the Holy Roman Emperor, Raphael and many other artists attained international fame, respect, and wealth. Artists who could attach themselves to a princely court, such as Andrea Mantegna and Leonardo da Vinci in the 14th century, and Giorgio Vasario, Vasari and Benvenuto Cellini in the 16th earned a regular salary and could enforce their style on others. By the late 16th century, academics under the princely patronage began to replace the guilds. The artist at work. Artists almost always worked on commission. It would, have, it would not have, been, have occurred to an artist of the 13th or 14th century to paint a picture or carve a statue for any reason other than to satisfy a patron and an artist who was a good manager would have had block a backlog of commissions. Those who were not good managers were often late delivering finished works to their patrons. Artists did not work in the kind of studios that we associated with later centuries. The word itself, which means study in Italian, only came into use in the 17th century when artists were members of academics in the late Middle Ages and throughout much of the Renaissance. An artist worked in Bottega, a shop, a word that also encompasses the apprentices and paid assistants who labored under the direction of the master. Apprentices entering the system could be as young as seven or eight, and their instruction was paid by, for by their families until the late 16th century. Women were excluded from the apprenticeship system in part because they were forbidden to join the appropriate guilds. Sometimes the bottega was entered like a shop, from the street and the artist at work might be viewed by a passerby. Artists might even exhibit finished work to the public in, the sh in their shops. Masaccio, Lorenzo Giroberte, Andrea del Castig Castagena, Antonio del Palaglio, and others might accept commissions for jewelry, painted wooden trays, customarily given to new mothers, painted shields for tournaments, profession, er, processional banners, or designs for embroidered vestments or other garments. Artists also designed triumphal arches, floats, and costumes for festivals that celebrated civic, religious, and private events. Unfortunately, little of this work survived. Its loss is a huge lacuna in our study and understanding of Italian Renaissance art. We do, however, have a glimpse of such works and a potage of the period of in 15th century Florentine engraving. The workshop of the goldsmith sculptor at the lower left shows ever viewers large pl plates and elaborate belts being offered for sale while an engraver as is at work on a copper plate to be used to make a print. 
Outside the shop, a bust of a man wearing elaborate armor is displayed, and the master is a carving a female portrait bust. Note how the counter protrudes on, into the street and how the opening could cl be closed by dropping a hinged flap up, held open by a hook on the building's facade. A painter is shown not in his bottega, but working in his situ on scaffolding, adorning the structure with garlands and ribbons inspired by the sculptural decoration found on ancient Roman structures. He is accompanied by an assistant who is grinding pigments in the structure to the right. Bookseller displays his wares on the lower floor, while above a musician plays an organ. Mercury shown in a chart, or I'm sorry, Mercury shown in a cart drawn by hawks is protecting the arts as they were practiced in Florence. For their tower building in the the background is the Palazzo di Pieri, the arch structure, the Logia della Signora. In the 16th century, the Bottega declined the is declined in importance because of the new emphasis of, of on the creative genius of the individual artist. By mid-century, the new academic conception of the artist dominated and his old age Michelangelo would protest that we, that he, quote, was never a painter or a sculptor like those who keep shops. The products of painters. The principal objects made by a painter in Bottega were altarpieces. Such artworks functioned as public religious images set upon altars in churches. An altarpiece might represent the Virgin Mary or Christ or depict the saint to whom a particular church or altar was dedicated together with scenes from his or her life. Here is the picture for this section. Up to the 13th century, with exact date varying from place to place, the priest stood behind the altar facing the, co the congregation. With the celebration in this position, there was space on the altar only for the required cru crucifix. Liter literature, liturgical, I can't pronounce that, book, candles, and vessels of the mass decoration including images and narrative scenes, was limited largely to the front of the altar. This decoration could be sculpted in stone or precious metals or painted in wood panels, known as altar frontals. For stone examples, the new position of the priest left, left the altar table open for large-scale religious images in the 13th century. The ritual was moved in front of the altar so that the priest had his back to the congregation. In the 14th century, newly wealthy middle-class families began to pay for altar pieces and even for individual family chapels in which mass could be said daily sometimes many times a day, for the souls of departed family members. The crucifix required for every altar was a logical theme. The 13th century also saw tremendous growth in the ver vener veneration of the Virgin Mary. Patrons began to commission the images of the Madonna and child that play so large a part in Italian art. If the chapel was large, the side walls, the space above the altarpiece and the vaulted ceiling might be painted in fresco. With subjects related to that of the altarpiece and by the same artist, many of the paintings treated in this book came to, from such family, 
family chapels. Some are still in place. Altarpieces and the smaller pictures intended for the private homes as aids to personal and familial devotions were almost always composed of wooden panels painted in tempura. Two panels joined together offering two subjects were known as a diptych, a diptych. More common, however, were the triptychs and polyptychs. The architectural frames of which often suggest the facades of Gothic churches, frames with the classical plasters became common during the 15th century. An altarpiece on the main altar of a large church or cathedral might have been might have images and scenes painted on the back as well. The custom of paintings in the predella or base of the altarpiece with small narrative scenes visible only at close range began early in the 14th century. At the same time, the principles, the pinnacles began to, to be decorated with the angels, saints, or narrative scenes. The iconography of the altarpiece was determined by the clergy or by the wealthy of the family who ordered it, and even its shape could be subject to the patron's taste. Sometimes chapter houses intended for the meetings of a community of monks or nuns and sark Castic sacrist, I'm sorry, it's getting late. Sacretist, where the vessel books and vestments of the liturgy were kept, were endowed as the as family chapels and provided with altars. The dining in room in a monastery or nunnery was called the reflectionary as rooms in which the members of the religious community ate silently while listening to sermons or readings. They were often decorated on the scene of the Last Supper. The most famous example is by Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci. It just ends there. <laughs> Sorry, the practice of drawing... Drawing the Renaissance art was seldom made without some kind of perpetuary study. Before the 16th century, these studies were often made on parchment or vellum, processed animal skin that could be cleaned or washed and used again. The few drawings that do survive from the period before 1430 seem to be pages from what are known as pattern books, completions, of drawings that might be useful in creating new works. See figures. These were perceived preserved because they would be useful in the botiga, not because they were considered to be works of art and in of themselves. Surviving examples included copies of works of arts, models for standard composition and drawings of animals, birds, human figures, and heads. Drawing was regarded as the foundation of an art by Sinini Sinini, an artist who wrote to Libra de Art, the Book of Art, in about 1400. Crinini developed 20, 28 brief chapters in his handbook that to the subject advising the painter to draw daily on paper, parchment, or panel with pen, charcoal, chalk, or brush. He urged the artist to draw from nature, from the paintings of the nature of the masters, or from the imagination a generation later, the architecture and theorist Liam Bosta. Alberta, writing in Florence, spoke of concepts and models, doubtless sketches and detailed drawings. As customary preparations for painting and for story, 
In the mid-16th century, Giorgio Vasaria described sketches as, quote, a first set of drawings that are made to find the poses and the first composition dashed down in haste by the artist from which drawings, quote, in good form, will later be made. The importance of the preparatory drawings may well have varied considerably from Batego to Batego, but the evidence suggests that the 14th century painter drew a, and sta such standard subjects as Madonna's saints and crucifixes directly on the surface of the work would work it to be painted. Such drawings would be lost when the later artist painted over them or course. But studies technology sometimes allows glimpses of the underlings. Underdrawing, sorry. The painter might also have sketched complex figural composition in small scale on paper or parchment to be kept next to the painting as a guide in the early stage. Do, does paint drippings and the test, water test, I'm sorry, water and tear of the Bottega, I would have rendered such sketches hardly be worth pres preserving. By the more mid 14th century, the cor suavo, Italian for dust off, a new technology previously used for ornamental borders came to into border usage. The Sephora was a full-scale drawing of a complex detail such as the head, the main figure, the outlines of the drawing were pricked with a sharp point and then the drawing was placed on the painter's surface it was ta taped with a sponge, porous bag loaded with charcoal and dust, thus tra transferring row of dots outlining the design. Surprisingly, these dots can sometimes be made, still be made out. In the early 16th century, the Spavavu was replaced by the cartoon from the Italian word cartoon, a heavy paper. A full-scale drawing made on sheets of paper glued together is necess if necessary. The cartoon was pressed against so, oh, sorry, transferred. The cartoon was pressed against the surface to be painted and its outlines were transferred by means of metal points or stylus. Several cartoons and fragments of cartoon survive, including one of for the lower figures in Raphael's philosophy, see figure 17.47, 17.48. But they are few and far between. They are few compared to the thousands that must have been executed. Two important compositions to Leonardo and Michelangelo are known only because other artists made copies of their cartoons. See figures 16.30 and 16.42. This is the end of chapter one, part one. Thank you.